Well, good afternoon to you. Well, what I, I have a mission today, and that mission is to achieve three goals. My first goal is to convince you that the initial notion of a digital divide that was articulated 20 years ago and that was used to explain the inequities that were generated as a result of access or non-access to technologies is no longer relevant. Then I want to persuade you, I want to persuade you that there is yet a new form of digital divide that is already having a significant impact in classrooms in creating or exacerbating differences that already exist. I think most importantly, my goal today, my third goal, is to motivate you as parents, as policymakers, as educators, and as students, that there are steps that you need to take, that we must take now, if we ever hope to lessen the inequalities that are emerging in schools. So what is the initial notion of a digital divide, for those who may not know? It was a term that was coined in the Clinton administration, and it was meant to represent the significant disparities in access to technologies that was presumed to be fueling the achievement gap that was existing. According to the logic of the digital divide, if we invested deeply in funding technology, bringing it into the classrooms, making it available to all students, the notion of the achievement gap should lessen. But now I want to move you forward 20 years to the generation of today which is called the I generation, I for internet. Immediately, if you've watched your children, your grandchildren, um, any adolescents around you, you know that access to digital technology is not a major cause of discrepancies in school achievement. What is at the heart of this emerging new digital divide is rather the way those technologies are put to use in these children's lives. This is what I mean by the non-smart use of smart technologies. Now, as with the original digital divide, there is again the have and the have-nots. The haves within this new digital divide are those who have learned how to harness the power of the internet, the power of these digital devices to forward their thinking, to support their learning in deep and meaningful ways. The have-nots are those students, and we know who they are, who feel powerless to resist the seduction and non-productive uses to which these technologies are being used. The question is, what can we do? What can we do? Because if you have children, if you have grandchildren like I do, you know what I am talking about. You see their absorption in these non-productive, non-smart use of technologies. I would say to you, there's plenty we can do. To the parents in this audience, I would say to you, the first thing I would begin to do, as young as possible, is to help these students, these children, set parameters for meaningful and effective use of those technologies. How much of a time of day should they be on those technologies? Right now, we know from the research, ours and others, that 12 to 17-year-olds are, on average, online nine hours a day. And much of that time is spent in non-productive use of technology. We also know that there are entire, within the, psych the psychological literature, entire devotions now to obsessions with the technology. We have more than half of uh, adolescents of the I generation who cannot be separated from their smartphones. 
As a matter of fact, they hold them in their hands the entire day. We also know that because of this constant online behavior, that these students are engaged in multitasking. And what, no matter what they tell you, the research is very clear. You do not learn well when you are engaged in multitasking. What is even more of concern to me as a longtime educator is that the effects of this new digital divide is more than academic. What we know now from our research and others is that the longer students spend online, the more depressed they are, the more anxious they are, and the more they report being socially isolated and feeling alone. We cannot let this continue. And it's even worse for those students who have never experienced success in schools because this, this persuasive use, non-smart use of technologies is affecting just about every student I've encountered in a classroom. So I'm motivating you today, or I'm urging you to join me to begin to make a difference. And the differences can be made. Parents, as I said, set those parameters but also become role models for the wise use of those technologies, where you use them in your children's presence, how you use them. I would also say if you do not know what your children are doing when they're online, you need to know. They are vulnerable, and the internet is not always a welcoming place. Educators in the room, I think it's important that when you choose to use technology in a classroom, you know why. You know what it contributes to that lesson, and that's very important. You also know what your children are, your students are capable of doing in the absence of technology, as well as with that technology. And students, one of the things I've learned by gathering data from the students that I teach is you need to be aware of your own habits with regard to technology use. How long are you using it on a day? and how are you using it? If we succeed to work together, I do believe change can be made, and it needs to be made. This is not a healthy situation, and it continues to exacerbate whatever inequalities exist in classrooms already. But I, I am optimistic. I do believe if we c collaborate, we make and we work together, that we can free students of the unhealthy bonds to these technologies and allow them to soar and realize optimal learning for all students. I want to thank you for listening to me, and I hope, I hope you are motivated and continue. Thank you so very much for listening. <laughs>